Praise the Lord. If you are glad to be here, clap your hands. Give the Lord some worthy praise. Worthy praise. Worthy praise. Worthy praise. Worthy praise. Now, I want you to bless God for my best friend, Pastor Flo. Your pastor. You're not a regular guy. The Bible says you, you count them who labor in the word double honor. The thing I love about Pastor Flo is the fact that he labors in the word. So I want us to give him a we love you shout praise God for his life. Go ahead and bless God for Dr. Flo. Logic. It keeps getting better every year. Last year wasn't like this. This year is different. And next year will sure be better than this. If you believe that, say yes. This is, you know, it's, it's, an, emotional, it's an emotional place for Pastor Flo and I because we remember the beginning. We know how things started and how far God has brought him. And the only thing I keep asking is, if he didn't do this, where will be all of this? He released the gift. He released the call. And we see the fruit of the call. We bless God for Pastor Flo. We bless God for Pastor Flo. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Maka, we love you. God bless you for your labor of love. You pastor the man. He pastors the people. So thank you for all that you do. Please, let's celebrate Bishop Wale Ajayi as well. Again, Pastor Frida and um, also Pastor Ayu Alabi. We love this man of God dearly. We celebrate you. And also my girlfriend, my wife. Yes, please. I, I want you to specially clap because she allowed me come. <laughs> I love my Bielsa babe. To God be the praise and glory. Lift your hands as we lift your hands and bless the Lord for the opportunity to hear the word. Bless the Lord for all that he's about to do. Thank him. Bless the Lord. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. For his good and his mercies endures forever. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your voices, everybody. Worship the Lord. Bless him. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. Come on, thank him for all that he has done for you in Christ. All that he accomplished for you in Christ. Give him praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name who forgives all our iniquities, who heals us of all our diseases, who crowns our lives with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies our mouth with good things so our youth is renewed like an eagle. He made his ways known to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercies towards us. As far as the east is from the west, so has he separated us from our transgressions. We bless him because he has made us righteous. We are the righteousness of God. Lift your hands, bless him. Come on, bless him, bless him. This is the most important thing to give thanks to God for. Your salvation, your redemption. Bless him, bless him. Thank you for victory in Christ. And for in Jesus' name we pray. Now before you take your seat, I want us to give God a victory shout. You don't shout for victory. You shout from victory. You already know that. So we're going to let something come out from our bellies right now. So you will give God a shout because you know you are in victory. Are you ready? So church, come on, open your mouth and give the Lord a victory shout. Victory shout, 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 victory shout. 
Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. If you're a Bible student of the grace of God, you are well taught. This is one of the pivotal scriptures of the Bible that speaks of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. It says, for I am not, I want us to read it together in concert, if that's fine. All right, so let's read it together. One to go. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Next verse. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let's say that together. The just shall live by faith. Again, the just shall live by faith. Talking about the power of the gospel. The gospel is not you acting and God responding. Religion is you acting, trying to get a response from God. But the gospel is you responding to what God has done in Christ Jesus. And it's important to have this mentality because you might be tempted to slip into performance if you do not see what the gospel is saying. The law said if you keep the commandments, if you keep all that God has instructed, then I will bless your water, I will bless your bread. You're going out and you're coming in is blessed. But if you do not, you are cursed. But in the gospel, we love him because he first loved us. So the gospel doesn't say you initiate. God has taken a move already with you. God has a stand with you. The Bible says that you've been accepted in the beloved. So your performance doesn't determine your acceptance. You are accepted in the beloved. 1 John 4 verse 19. For we love him because he first loved us. The gospel is not heaven at last, but heaven at first. Because if you were raised with Christ, you seek those things that are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. So the gospel says that heaven for you is not a destination. Heaven is where you already are. Because you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. The Bible declares also that when Christ who is our life shall come, we shall all appear with him in glory. Paul speaks in Colossians chapter 1 and he says, To the saints in Colossus who are faithful, who are in Christ first of all, but who are in Colossus. Meaning that your destination is Christ before where you are. So the gospel says you are heaven bound. The gospel is not heaven help those who can't help themselves. The gospel is heaven has come to help those who can't help themselves. For the Bible says in due time, while we were without strength, Christ died for us. The gospel also says that God commended his love to us as in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel is not saying, Father, forgive me because you have been forgiven. Acts chapter 13 verse 38, that through this man is preached unto you, this Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. And how many people here believe that their sins have been forgiven? If you believe your sins are forgiven, wave your hand, say yes. yes. Acts chapter 26 verse 18 says, To open their eyes and to turn them from what? Darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. So, the time forgiveness was provided is not when you received it. Forgiveness was provided by the work of Jesus on the cross. 
I remember those prayers we always prayed. Father, forgive us for any sin. Father, forgive me for all the sins that I've committed. Those ones I've done knowingly and unknowingly. Who prayed those prayers before? Yes. When I was very young, I told myself that when I, just in case of anything, if, if I'm about to die, may I be conscious before I die so I can pray the prayer. Because in my mind, praying the prayer is what gives me access to heaven. But the truth is, I was forgiven before I prayed. I was forgiven before I even asked for the forgiveness. The only thing that changes the game is when I receive what has been provided. Somebody say yes. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18. It says, to wit that God was in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them, but has what committed to us right? The ministry or the word of reconciliation. The word imputing there, it says logizomai, which is to take an inventory or to number. So God is not numbering your sins. God is not taking inventory of what you have done wrong. The gospel is saying, I have forgiven you and I have loved you with an everlasting love. The gospel is not love your neighbor as yourself. That's not the gospel. Because the question of who the neighbor is in the Greek or in the Jews, I mean for the Jews, is that your neighbor is a fellow Jew. So when a man says love your neighbor, they know who they are talking about. A neighbor is my fellow countryman Jew. But the gospel is love one another, not your neighbor. Love one another as I have loved you. John chapter 13 and verse 34. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have what? Received. And wherein you what? You stand. So the gospel you receive is the gospel you are standing on. You don't have new experiences outside Christ. Anything that makes you go outside Christ is not the gospel. So the gospel I receive is the gospel I stand on. Somebody say yes. The gospel I have gotten is the gospel I am living by. Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 13 verse 43, it says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes Followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue. Somebody say continue. Continue in what? The grace of God. So when you receive the gospel, you continue in the grace of God. There are no dimensions outside of Jesus. There are no portals outside of Jesus. Jesus is the only portal. Jesus is the only dimension. Are you with me, someone? Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, it says that Christ may dwell in your heart, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, come on, the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of his love, to know the love of God, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So if you are going outside of depth, height, breadth, length, what else are you doing? Everything we'll do, everything we will do is within the circumference of his love. As a matter of fact, you can't grow outside of his love. You can never become so independent of his love. Naturally, when we mature, we become independent. But spiritually, when we mature, we become more dependent. We become more dependent on the one who has loved us. Somebody say yes. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, Paul says, I deliver unto you the gospel which I also received. And I'm, I'm saying this because a lot of people think that the message of Paul is contradicting the message of Christ. Paul says that I declare to you the message which I received. So Paul is not the initiator of the gospel. Paul received the gospel. Are you with me someone? 
In Galatians 1, it says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the gospel came to Paul by revelation. He said to the people that I preached it to you and you received it. You are standing by it. I also received it as you received it. Are you following what I'm saying? So the gospel was received by Paul. Somebody say he was received. Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 26. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Do we have the living Bible? I think I would like to see the living Bible there on this verse. Yeah. But I will send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the source of all truth. Let's read that part together. He will what? He will come to you from the Father and he will tell you you know what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying that disciples, I know you guys. We've been together for three and a half years. But you don't know me by my being with you. He says that you, when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes in my absence. So therefore, you, you know me when I am gone. And when I am gone is when I'm glorified. There were some people who came to meet Jesus. At, they were called the Greeks. They said, we want to see Jesus. And they met Philip. Philip went to meet Andrew. Andrew went to meet Jesus, both of them. And they said, there are some Greeks who want to see you. And the answer Jesus gave is, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Then except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now the question is, what is the connection between the question and the answer? Jesus explains the answer but with a parable. So he says, my answer of whom you want to see is I am not the person you want to see. The me you want to see is the me who is dead, who is buried, who is resurrected. So Jesus, who we know, the Bible says, know we no man after the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. So we don't want to know Jesus. That's why, you know, be, behind the veil, while the lintel, they put the blood on the lintel and the Bible says the angel of death was passing. The Bible says they were commanded to eat the lamb roasted. What that means is the lamb we see is not a living lamb. We see the roasted lamb. And when you talk about a roasted lamb, you're talking about a lamb that has passed through the cross. So the Jesus we want to see is the Jesus who died, who was buried, and who rose on the third day. For as he is, not as he was, but as he is. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? So the Jesus we want to see is the Jesus who is dead, who is alive. Death could not hold him. The grave could not stop him. Nothing could stop because the Bible says he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised up for our justification. Meaning that when Jesus was raised up, it signified your justification. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell you that sin and death had nothing on Jesus. The Bible says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? And what that means is that the sting of death is sin. Are you following what I'm saying? If you know about the honey bee, the honey bee, after it stings, it has to die. Because the stinger has left the bee. So when death looked at Jesus and it stung Jesus, death died after stinging Jesus. Death could not survive. The Holy Lamb of God that was risen on the third day. So that is why it says, Oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? Because he became seen that we might become. 
Now the Bible says, this is what we call righteousness apart from the works of the law. But it goes beyond that to sin apart from works. Oh, I just said something that you may have missed. There is a difference between righteousness apart from works, but it didn't start with righteousness apart from works. It started with sin apart from works. Because he made him who knew no sin. So it means he didn't commit a sin, but he was made sin. So this is sin apart from works. And if sin apart from works is endorsed by God, then it means righteousness apart from works has to be endorsed by God. We are those who know they are righteous in God. We are those who know they are righteous in Christ. If you know you are righteous in Christ apart from works, shout yes, somebody. Look at your neighbor, say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Look at two people, say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Righteousness of God in Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that the disciples, especially John and Peter, ran to the tomb. There was something John saw in the tomb that made him believe. John chapter 20. The Bible says that when he saw the strips of the linen, he saw and he believed. He says, I deliver unto you the gospel which I received. How that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. How that he was buried and how that he rose according to the scriptures and he was seen of Cephas what that part means is that there were witnesses of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus now time is calibrated by his coming where you have before Christ but there is no archaeologist that can show us a fossil relic of the remains of Jesus ever because the tomb of Jesus is empty all other, all other gods are in the grave but ours is not in the grave anymore Ours is risen on the third day. And the Bible says, if Christ is risen, then our preaching is not in vain. Then our faith is not in vain. All of these things we're doing, we're not wasting our time because he rose on the third day. So I put my faith on the fact that Jesus rose on the third day. Not, nothing could stop Jesus from rising. So when they, they got into the tomb and they saw the strip, it was, it was you know, if, if you are... I'm not sure if this is POP, but if you want to embalm, according to the Jews back in those days, they get spice and they use the silk and the linen, they mix it with spice. And after a while, from semi solid, it might look like a cast. Because when you're making your POP from the initial stage, it looks like a semi solid. But after a while, it becomes a hard cast. Now, when they saw the tomb, they saw that when they had embalmed Jesus, the linen was still lying in its place. I, I, I wish you have, I wish you have the living Bible. Or is it the living? John chapter 20. It says the linen was still in its place. So it was not by supernatural empowerment John saw and believed. It was by physical evidence. Because when he looked into the cast, he would see the holes where the eyes are. The cast is intact, but there is no body inside the cast. So he saw it and he believed that truly. Jesus is risen. It's not like Lazarus where he said, lose him and let him go. Because they had to lose Lazarus after he came back to life. But Jesus, they didn't lose Jesus, but he was gone. Jesus was out of the things that bound the normal embalmed body. And what bound the embalmed body was intact, but his body was out of there. There are experiences and witness to the fact that he rose on the day. Now, when he rose, you know what happens? You rose with him. You experience victory with him. You experience joy with him. You experience peace with him. If the death, if the hell, if the thing that plagued Jesus could not hold him down, nothing can hold you down. Let me announce to you, you are hell tested. I said you are hell tested. I said you are hell tested. I said you are hell tested. What does that mean? It means I can't go back to the death that I came back from. No! Nicodemus asked a question that is so important to a truth. Jesus said, except a man be born again, 
He cannot what? See the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Does that mean he will enter for the second time into his mother's womb? Then Jesus answered, not countering what Nicodemus said, but explaining what Nicodemus said. He said, that which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. In other words, what is born of flesh? If it's a human being that comes out of the woman's womb, the human being cannot go back. Because the womb is what he died to. So he can't go back to the womb. So it is for those of you who are born of the spirit. If you are born of the spirit, you can't go back to death. You don't hear what I'm saying. I said if you are born of the spirit, you can't go back to death. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Because you are not under the law. But you are under grace. Galatians 1 verse 6 I marvel that you are soon so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. So Paul is saying that if you reject the grace message you are rejecting a man. So don't think you are attacking a doctrine. You are attacking the person of the doctrine because he's the embodiment of the grace of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 1, it says it's the gospel of God. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. He calls it the gospel of God, not the gospel of his son. The gospel of God because it's the gospel according to a promise. Speaking about someone. Then verse 2 of Romans chapter 1 says, Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son. So the gospel is about a promise of a son. Are you with me somebody? Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared Jesus to be. The son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. The spirit of holiness is talking about the spirit but that separates Jesus and marks him out as the one you identify to whom the promise is fulfilled. Do you hear what I'm saying? So when he says according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead it is saying that how you will know this promised son is the one is look for any son that I have that is raised from the dead so if you see him in the course of time raised from the dead then he's the one I'm talking about and thank God Jesus was risen from the dead the Bible says Ephesians 1 verse 13, he calls it the gospel of your salvation in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard of the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation in whom also we have after that we believed we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Look at your neighbor say I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit is the foretaste of what God has promised. God said, I'm going to give you two billion. But he says, today, take 500 million. So that you believe that the two million is sure. When you see the one you have at hand now. So the Holy Spirit is a foretaste of what is coming in the future. And it says, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I schooled in Benin and I was under the care of Bishop Wally and Pastor Frida. And then while I would do my run around trying to wrap up my medical program, I would see that some market women had marks on the arm. Blue marks, red marks, green marks, and all those marks. What is the mark signifying? The mark is saying it is your own because you paid for it. That's what the mark means. And because you don't want to carry so many things while you're going around the market, you pay for the yam, but it's marked and kept for you. And then you go buy other things and come back for the one that has your mark on it. 
And what that means is when Jesus is coming back, he's coming back for those that have the mark of Christ. He's coming back for those that have the seal of Jesus, the seal of the Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, I have the seal of the Holy Ghost. It is called the gospel of the kingdom. Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and 15. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Which means to me that if you are a kingdom preacher and you say the gospel is one of the topics, then you don't understand the message of the kingdom. Because the message of the kingdom is the sum total of the gospel. If you are not teaching the gospel, then you are not speaking from the kingdom's perspective. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5 and verse 6, it says, Ooh, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who has made us able ministers of the new covenant. For the letter killeth, the spirit gives life. And when the Bible says he has made us able ministers of the new covenant, it did not say he has made us able ministers in the new covenant. Because if it says he has made us able ministers in the new covenant, it talks about the dispensation you are ministering. Yes. But he says he has made us able ministers of, not in. Hear this. Every pastor today is a minister in the new covenant because you don't decide the dispensation by your Bible study. You don't decide the dispensation by your personal revelation. The dispensation decides the message. The message does not change the dispensation. So every prophet, every apostle, every pastor is a minister in the new covenant. But not every pastor is a minister of the new covenant so he says who has made us able ministers of the new covenant it speaks to what we are ministering that what we are ministering is Christ if it is not Christ then it's not what we want to hear Paul said that when I came to you I decided not to know anything other than Christ and him crucified Look at what happened to Peter when he went to Cornelius' house. The Bible says when he got there, ooh, I wish I had the time to show you. Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. He got there. Let me show you. Acts chapter 10 verse 1 and verse 4. Let's go straight to verse 4 because we don't have the time. It says, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. Look at verse 2 and see the credentials of Cornelius. Verse 2. See the credentials of Cornelius. A devout man. Somebody say devout man. One that feared God. Say one that feared God. Said the one who gave much alms, and what the one who what he prayed. Ah, Cornelius, they pray. But look at verse 6. Let me show you what the angel said to Cornelius after you saw the credential of Cornelius. Verse 6 says, Acts chapter 10. He lodged with one Simon Etana, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So that means what you are doing before is not necessarily what that oughtest to do. So after I prayed, after I gave alms, after I am being a devout man, after I have feared God, there is still something to do that is beyond performance and when I read Acts chapter 10 I found out that there was nothing Cornelius did I saw that there was nothing Cornelius performed all Cornelius did was to hear and believe and when Peter was speaking the words Acts 10 38 how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power and he went about doing good listen you can preach Jesus and not preach the gospel 
You can talk about Jesus and not talk about the gospel. Because if the Jesus you are preaching is the Jesus before the cross, then that's the history of Jesus. But if the Jesus you are preaching is the Jesus after the cross, then you are preaching the gospel. So when Peter was saying how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good, nothing happened. But in verse 43, when he got to the point where he said to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remissions of sins. The Bible says the Holy Ghost fell. Which means that the Holy Ghost was waiting for the redemptive work. There is a difference between the works of Jesus and the finished work of Jesus. So the Holy Ghost was waiting and the moment he said that, he says, to him gave all the prophet witness that through his name, through his name, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Through his name, as many as received him to them gave him power to be called the sons of God. Even those who believe in his name, through his name, that whosoever, whosoever is whosoever. Whosoever is whosoever. The whosoever may be your ex, but God loves him. It's hurtful. And like I told you, love your neighbor as yourself is not the gospel. But love one another is the gospel as Christ has loved you. You don't have any love to give. The only love you have to give is the love you receive. So out of the abundance of how you have received God's love, that is how you give. I always tell husbands and wives, the best gift you can give your wife is to receive love from God. Because you can't love your wife like the way a man should that is optimum to God's standard. So if you receive the love of God, then you know how to love your wife right. If you receive the love of God, you know how to love your husband more. Are you with me, someone? So what that means is that the Holy Ghost came upon those Greeks when they heard, when he heard Peter talking about the redemptive work of Jesus. Then finally, I am not ashamed. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The word faith to faith there does not mean faith to faith to faith to faith. Faith to faith there means faith in the promise to faith in the fulfillment of the promise. That's what faith to faith means there. But it says I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul is not saying I'm not shy of the gospel. No. He said, I'm not ashamed. What he means is I trust the gospel to deliver. That the gospel will not begin and leave you halfway. Ah, you don't hear what I'm saying. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting. Which means the future salvation he's bringing is based on a past sacrifice. So when you are confused about how the death of Jesus forgives your sins, past, present, and future, you don't really realize that the future is not the problem. Because the problem is what is behind the sacrifice. But the sacrifice speaks forward. From the present to where it is, and then to forward as it goes. So when he says that the blood of Jesus has not the ability to go forward only, but it went to the past where Adam, Abraham, David, who were waiting in the bosom of Abraham, that blood had the power to go forward and had the power to go backwards. So there was something about the blood 
of Jesus. Now he says the coming salvation is sorted out by a past sacrifice. So I'm not afraid if the gospel leaves me hanging. If I pray a prayer right now and I say you say amen to the prayer when I make it. That let your journey from Lagos to Ibadan be done according to your righteousness. May you not have a miscarriage except you are not perfect. That means if you are not perfect, you have a miscarriage. Who can say amen to that? So, without holiness, no man can see God. And they have disturbed the body of Christ. As if to say it is your holiness that makes you see God. No, what that scripture means is without holiness, people around you can't see God in you. But God doesn't need your touch light because he's the bright and the morning star. God is not looking for your little light. The little light that shines for men. For by their fruits we shall know them. That is for all of us. But God does not need your fruit. For the Lord knows those who are his. That even without fruit, he knows that this is my child. He's not just behaving well, but he's my child. My father, my father, a lot of you know my father, Bishop Branson Bello. 2004, he called me. He said, son, I want to teach you what it means to be righteous. I said, okay. He was holding his pen. He said, take the pen. And I took the pen. He said, write with it. I wrote with it. He wrote. He said, what is that called? I said, it's a pen. He said, good. I felt like I was kindergarten because that was too, it was a no-brainer for me. Then he said, pick the other pen there. He knew it wasn't working. So I picked it and he said, write with it. I wrote with it. It wasn't working. He said, what is it called? I said, it's still a pen. So he said to me, a pen is a pen whether it writes or not. You are righteous. Even if you are not using your righteousness. You are righteous in Christ. For through his death. By one man. One man. Death reigned. But how much more we who have received the abundance of grace. And the gift of righteousness. We reign in life. Now. That is not a license to say you can do what you want to do because you are righteous. No. Because sin is still sinful. It's just that sin has lost its power over you. So now you have the ability to say no. Because the Holy Spirit in you can say no. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we continue any longer therein? Because we died to sin. He says, know ye not that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That as Christ was raised by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in the newness of life. If we have been planted in the likeness of his death, we shall be planted in the likeness of his resurrection. He says, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. He did not say we shall behave. He says we shall be because your behavior does not affect your becoming. It's your becoming that affects your behavior. For as many as received him, to them gave him power to become. Sons of God. My father, in the days, in their days of the law, they were not playing. My dad went to Port Harcourt many years ago. It's probably in the late 80s to suspend a pastor who had rug in his office. Yes. It's my dad. But today he taught me the gospel, you know. Thank God. You know, see, see what my father did that I respect so much. After over 20 years of teaching the law, he came back to the whole congregation and he said, you know what? Forgive me. I'm going to start all over from the beginning. 
And he was not afraid that his crowd will go. That's what they call humility. Humility is submitting to the word of God. Not afraid of the fact that you lose control. No. So my father said, it's in the days of, in their days of the law, suspended someone for, we are flexing. We are flexing. We are having a good time. Rug. You are having rug when souls are perishing. My sisters did not have earrings until they were in the university. Yes, he knows two of my sisters. My father suspended someone who had a Volvo. Brand new Volvo because souls are perishing and you are buying brand new Volvo. Souls are perishing. Souls. But today, he told me, he said, son, before, when I go to a place, I smell sin. Mm. When you come to a place, you say, there's iniquity smelling in this place. I don't know, maybe you had a good background, I don't know. But if you know what I'm talking about. He say, I smell iniquity here. But he says, now, when I come to a place, I see saints. Ha! <sighs> You see, that's why people, people like Big Daddy, Daddy Mike, we should hear them. Because there's where they are coming from. That they know what they are telling you when they are preaching the gospel with the whole of their passion and their life. We don't take light of this message. Because Paul says, neither count I my life dear to myself. That I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So he says, my life is worth nothing if I don't use it for the gospel. A lot of people are so in touch with pain more than Jesus. And you call it my pain. No, it's not my pain. No, it's not my pain. Because he carried my infirmities. He took my sorrows. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes, I'm healed. I gotta go. Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause, he is mediator of the new covenant. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. You get tired of the word eternal, though. We go tired. Eternal. Eternal inheritance. Eternal redemption. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So eternal glory, eternal redemption, eternal inheritance. Everything is eternal. First John chapter 5 and verse 11. He says, my people, this is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life and he who had the son had this life. This son, this life is in the son. He who does not have the son does not have this life. So it means that I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. He's not saying I'm writing these things so that you are speculating. It's not probability, but it's predictable outcomes. This eternal life, it has the capacity to bring you in, to keep you, and to present you. So the life of Jesus perfects you, and it presents you faultless before God. It's not the kind of life that leaves you halfway. So you know what? You and I have eternal life. We have the life that is working in us. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying, but I've got life that is working inside of me. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay a charge against God's elect? 
it is God who justified. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who is he that condemns? It is Jesus that died. Yea, rather, it is him that was risen. Who Jesus rose on the third day. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. I've got eternal life. The life of God is working inside of me. Sickness cannot stand that life. Poverty cannot stand that life. Depression cannot stand that life. I have eternal life. If you have eternal life, wave your hand. Say, I have eternal life. Hey! Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor anything present, nor things to come, can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. I cannot be separated. I have eternal life. Slap your neighbor a high five. Say, you have eternal life. Look at somebody else and say, I got eternal life. Therefore, I prophesy upon your life. Life is working for you. Wherever you go, life will speak for you. Whatever you lay your hands on will prosper. Whatever you do will prosper. I declare that everything that is dead is coming back to life. You are not hearing what I said. Everything dead is coming back to life. Everything dead is coming back to life. Wave your hands and say, I have life. Look at two people and tell them, you have life, you have life. You have life, you have life. The life that works in me. The life that works for me. I've got the life of Jesus. I was buried with him. I rose with him. I'm seated with him. I've got life. The life of God is not a respecter of death, not afraid of death. Jesus told the two disciples, can you drink the cup? And they said, we will drink. And they indeed drank. You saw two people who were struggling to die, James and John. Dying was not a problem. They were not afraid. He says he destroyed through death. He destroyed him that had the power of death. He had it. He doesn't have it anymore. I've got eternal life. Working inside of me. Working for me. Working in me. Working with me. Lift your hands. Come on. Come on. Lift your hands. I'm removing someone here now from what has been long standing and I'm declaring I'm speaking by the prophetic word of God that in the name of Jesus you are coming out of delays you are coming out of unnecessary pressures see there's a level of speed you need that you don't need obstacles on your path sometimes when something is too fast it's not a guarantee that it gets there on time but what it means is when you are without obstacles thank you brother it means that you can get to your destination faster there are some unnecessary things that are hanging and by the special blood that was shed on your behalf lift your hands everybody a decree in the name of Jesus that whatsoever is not planted of God whatsoever does not glorify God in your life it is uprooted from now as you shout a loud amen I declare it is so I said it is uprooted from now in the name of Jesus I command sickness to get out I command depression to get out I command cancer to get out. I command migraine headaches to get out. There was a lady who came for one of our services. She came with a lump in her breast. And then while I was ministering, I told her, I said, listen, the power of God is here and it's, it's going to bring healing to people who believe, who have received what Christ has done. Because the forgiveness of sin is the harder one. Healing is the easier one. How shall he not with him freely give us? So the giving of the him is the tougher part but if he gave Jesus everything else is simple so while I minister to her I said you can get your healing and she went to do a test and came back lump 
disappeared. Unwanted growth disappeared. Whatever is unwanted in your life, lift your hands. Whatever is unwanted in your life, if you know or you don't know, some of you might be pampering it, endorsing it, but it is not the will of God. I decree in the name of Jesus, it is uprooted from your life. I said it is uprooted from your life. Wave your hands if you are victorious in Christ. Now turn that wave into a shout of praise. Turn that wave into glory. Turn that wave into rejoicing. I am blessed. Blessed of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Your salvation is guaranteed. And if that salvation is guaranteed, the goodness of God follows you. Brother, I had a dream one day. A serious cow was pursuing me in the dream. What do you think happened? I ran. Thank you. And the color of the, the cow was army green. I listened to one of your messages. You know, you interpret your dreams. For God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but has in this last day spoken to us by son. So, it is not more of what the son is saying, but it is that God is saying the son. So, I learned to interpret my dream. And what I told myself is, Goodness and mercy is pursuing me. Like play, like play. Four people sent me big money that day. No joke, so. So I have learned to interpret my revelation by the Christ mind. Was it not Peter who said, you are the Christ? But Peter did not know the meaning of the Christ. There's a prophetic word. Lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. I see people overtaking. I see people recovering what is lost. I see people having a testimony that is undeniable. Now, before the end of this conference, God gave me this word that I'm sharing with you in Abuja. Before the end of this conference, before Sunday, let me tell you, you will see the goodness of God. As you shout amen, it is your experience. Wave your hands and shout hallelujah. Come on church, you can do much better than that. Clap your hands.